Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Oh my goodness. This is a big one tonight. We have Zach Bogle, the man, the myth, the legend from Stalemates out of Des Moines, Iowa. Hold on. I might not be getting the address correctly. What is the actual mailing address, Zach? Pleasant Hill, Southeast Polk, baby. Okay. Yep. So that is where you guys, you're, you're coming from us from, from the Des Moines area in Iowa, correct? Yep. Yep. Well, first off, welcome to the Barbarian Hour. Zach is the owner, creator, the brains behind Stalemates, some of the best web content you'll find out there. Uh, Zach came to prominence during COVID where he decided to uh, just kill it and start breaking things down on the wrestling community in the, I guess, an underserved market. Would you say that, Zach? Yeah, I think so. I think at the time I thought it was a bigger deal than it is now looking back. Cause at the time now looking back, I'm like, no wonder it worked. Cause nobody, there was nothing else going on. Everybody was sitting at home chilling, doing nothing. So in hindsight, it's not as big of an accomplishment as I thought, but um, it's been fun. I mean, Jared, would you say that he was an internet phenomenon in the wrestling community? It was like, to me, it was overnight here in Ohio. Everyone's like, Hey, have you seen yeah. the stalemates guy? Have you seen the stalemates guy? And then when you jumped on, uh, I think it brought a lot of attention to Ohio. And then you were like, he's from Ohio. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, kind of made sense, you know, why he hit so big in Ohio too, you know, and the roots here. And uh, it was like overnight. I was like, holy crap. And it, it caught quick. It, it, did Is it feel like it caught quick? Um, yes, it did. Yeah. I mean, the wrestling community is so small, right? Is it small in Ohio as well? <laughs> As small as you would imagine in a state of 11 plus million people. Yes. So everybody where it gets around fast and stuff like real fast. And, yeah. And Iowa, it's, it's small, but it's also not like you got like the Des Moines people, I feel like. And then there's all like the small town. So it's almost like there's two different uh, wrestling communities, but everybody, you know, every word gets around fast in the wrestling community. So um, what's crazy to me is like living in Iowa, obviously we have like a pretty big, like, Iowa heavy um, show sometimes, not intentionally, but I was only 12% of our audience. So it's kind of cool. What are the other well, big states? Wow. Yeah. Um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, honestly, a lot of East Coast. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Texas somehow, um, Ohio a little bit, Illinois. I mean, and then I was a big percent, but it's only 12%. Wow. Wow. So you guys are branched out and you got a great audience nationwide, East coast, all the way to the West coast. Did you think it would take hold like it did to that? Did you think that stalemates and what you were doing in the, in the man, this really awesome, like alternative view of, of the wrestling community, which it's a different community, right? We can all agree on yeah. that, but did you think it yeah. would take hold like it did? Um, I, Yes and no. I knew that if we did, I knew that if we did what we wanted to do in terms of like high quality production and stuff, I knew it'd catch people's eye. And then the other part was like, I don't know if wrestling community is willing to be kind of like goofy and silly. And like, if they're going to not like us because we are taught, we do talk about like drama and gossip and all the things you're told not to care about. And like, I know wrestling people, there's like this really strong, like, you know, strong morals, strong, uh, sense of like respecting others and stuff like that. And we cover, like, sometimes we cover stuff that's like not the brightest times in people's lives. So I was like, are people going to not like us, you know, kind of telling the drama of what's going on and stuff like that. I don't necessarily see it as like us, like exposing people. Cause it's not like we're out here. Like I'm not breaking news about, stuff that's not already out there i'm just telling people we're just trying to tell people like hey this is what's out there you don't have to go through the forums and read all the rumors and stuff like that we're just going to tell you what it is so yes and no you know it ended up i feel like people do like the drama more than they like to admit it you know people like to talk crap about the forums and 
Twitter and everybody talking and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, people read it. So the, the best content so far is when you're uh, watching your own match back. When you're watching oh, your you, own you match like back. that. Yeah, I think twelve people saw that, so I'm glad you liked that. Uh, I don't, I didn't, I didn't want people to see that because that, so that's a Patreon only episode, and so I, I'm like, you know what, I sucked as a wrestler, so if I can get out ahead of this before somebody else goes and finds finds it, then uh, I felt like it it would work out better. And the only thing I didn't like about that video is Marino didn't go hard enough. Like I wish Marino yeah. would have really. You were the harshest critic. Me. Yeah, he should have went. Yeah, right. I wish he would have went a little harder, but he's a nice guy. So yeah, keep that behind Patreon for sure. That, that that's yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. So so my greatest hold on. So my greatest piece of content on stalemates. Of, of course, Jared, you went with yours, which is him critiquing a match of himself. Thank you. Uh, yep. My greatest piece of content, and I think what really, really, really blew you up was the Willie Trials, right? And, sure. and once again, you know, with Willie Trials, um, I think we were all just so enamored with the, it was fascinating, right? And you were a Flow oh, yeah. fan early on, right? Like I yeah. was actually still working with them, and you're, you, lived, uh, you lived it, you know? I loved it, yeah, <laughs> sure. But anyhow, <laughs> you did, you were, you were there, you were, you knew like all the characters, right? Like you knew, uh, Martin, obviously you, you have a really good story of like how you guys met. You obviously know yeah. really, uh, Willie really well. Like all those people that were in the trial, like you knew them and <laughs> yeah. to people like me who followed it, it was interesting to see it all fall apart. Yeah. So, okay. He's right. Yes. I was, um, doing a lot of 1099 work for those guys and, what was funny is Tim Flynn's like, yeah, I just thought you were flow. Tim Flynn told me that because I worked with those guys for so a long. Lot people, at, a uh, lot of people thought that. A lot of people still think that. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, it. that's what's funny. No, exactly. The first time, Zeb was probably one of the first people in wrestling media that I really, like, made a relationship with. And it was so weird to hear his voice because forever I've watched, you know, people don't realize, like, before live events, it was like, hey, we're going to get this match. Like, this, somebody recorded this match and we're going to be able to watch it in an hour after it happens because someone's going to upload it and it was usually zeb and it was usually his voice commentating but you didn't ever get to see zeb's face really and so we always just heard zeb's voice so that's why whenever i yeah and whenever i met zeb <laughs> or like started talking to zeb I'm like this is so weird like it'd be like talking to chris collinsworth or something when you got a face made for radio jared this is how it should be not like this me being on camera but like how zach said it it was just, just like a mysterious voice of the way you explained it. Um, I had a couple of times in airports where people were like, I know your voice. What's your voice? And I was like, I was like, you're wrestling people, aren't you? And they're like, yeah, how'd you know? And I was like, that's how you know my voice. And it was like, it was weird places like uh, Denver and Portland and these places where you'd see people. And I was like, yeah, you're wrestling people. And oh yeah, yeah. How do you know? And I was like, oh yeah, I work with this website and I do a bunch of, um, I do a bunch of their commentary and I do a bunch of matches for them. Oh, that's I think, all I, I think. Yeah. I think you're the one of the best to ever do it. And I'm not just saying that I've said that to you off air. I've said it to other people behind your back. You're one of the best to, to behind ever do my back. back. Holy yeah. smokes. I like it yep. when it's said to my face. So that's good. But uh, no. So yeah, like, like you're saying, I was around it a lot, right? I was around it a lot and I saw it kind of unfold. And my thing, my, the biggest thing for me was um, what I was happiest about was uh, my name never got brought up in the trial. So that was, really? I was like, yeah. Oh, thank God. My name survived or another your, week. Or your, oh, or your oh text my God. Messages. Your text messages too. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. 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 Right. Because yeah, like, no. those are the, those are the only people I felt bad for like covering the trial was like, there was people who had private text messages that never should have been put out there. Um, was so wrong. We, that was so but wrong. We, but we did not include screenshots of those. But I mean, everybody was watching it. But at the same time, I'm like, some of it was part of the case, you know? Yeah. And, it, and that, that a lot of that bummed me out. But my favorite thing was like, I wasn't significant enough to their story to be in the trial. So I was happy. I was very happy with that. I was like, oh man, that's great. And it's exact. That's, that's, I appreciate you saying that. Um, when you say that, you know, like, yeah, you know, because Jared, as you can 
uh, Jared can attest to it. You know, we started Go High Outcast in 2009, right, Jared? Right, right. And, and, and then Jared's and stuff prior yeah, to that, and Jer- though, and that was kind of just gave you a brand, right? Yeah, 2008. Not that, that you needed it, but. Yeah, 2008, um, Martin, that was the state tournament where I picked Martin up. Or, and then 2007 was when I uh, uh, gave him a ride at the University U- U23 now Nationals to his hotel that wasn't closed because he was traveling with Mizzou or Oklahoma State, I forget. But but back to it, Zach, that that really changed things for me when you did that. The content you created around the Willie trials was like, first off, you created a comprehensive guide as to what the heck was going on and all that madness. And you you really comprehended what they were doing. And man, there were some villains created and there were some underdogs who came across and uh, some heroes in the wrestling community. But when you were doing that, was it just what was going through your mind as they're watching this thing unfold every day? Um, it, was, it was probably one of the most stressful weeks of my life because I, I also have like a day job and a life. I have a wife. I have a dog. I had a whole life. Well, when you work from nine to seven in my day job being a barber, then I have to go home and like I, I was also trying to listen to the trial. I mean, it would be like eight hours of trial a day. Um, I would go listen to the trial in my break times. Then I would also like listen to it when I got home, but I would put it on 2x speed. I had somebody, I won't say who, but somebody was recording it for me and they would send it to me and I would listen to it in 2x speed and it would go really fast. And then I would also pay people, not much, but I'd pay them like $20 to take notes. Like somebody who was at home all day, like they could watch the whole thing. I was like, if you'll take notes for me, that would be great. And then I would just take a collection of all that stuff, record the video, edit the video, upload the video. And so I was literally staying up until like two in the morning and then waking up at 6 a.m. so I could get that video up because the thing was, it was every day for like eight days. And so if you were behind a day, you missed a whole day of what was going on. Plus, I knew like that was like kind of supposed to be like our big moment of like finally we're able to like show people who we are. And I was like, I can't miss a day. I don't want somebody else coming out and doing it. So I was making sure no matter what, we were going to get that video up in some capacity. And like, on top of that, you got people tweeting you like, where's the video? Where's the video? Where's the video? And like, it was awesome, but it was also super stressful. The coolest thing that came from it, which the internet wrote an article about us um, a few weeks ago for uh, the first family street, kind of promoting it. And they, and uh, Courtney Wood, shout out to her, asked me like just some facts that, Uh, people might not know about us. One of the things that I told her was after the trial was over, um, I got a DM from a lawyer in Texas and she's like, Hey, do you have an email? And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, Oh God, this is, you know, I know Texas is where flows at. So a lawyer from Texas getting hold of me, this isn't exactly fun. And so I'm like, great. You know, cause I thought I did a pretty good job of like explaining stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm not a lawyer. So I was afraid they were going to sue me for like getting some facts wrong or something. And I'm like kind of on nerves or whatever. So that I get an email from the law firm of, I believe it was either Willie or Martin's law firm thanking us for doing it. And also told me that like Flo's lawyer tried to get my video shut down. No way. Via shutting no down. No way. Well, via shutting down down they wanted the live stream pulled off no way livingston ended up livingston ended up saying no like they knew they were trying to shut it down because they they heard of the videos because if you think about it nobody would have ever covered this like it was a non-compete case in texas like it it, wouldn't wouldn't have been public if it wasn't for covid right it wouldn't have been well it would have been public but nobody nobody would have went nobody would actually no it wouldn't have been on youtube right without COVID. Right. right correct it wouldn't have been on youtube but if, if it wasn't if it wasn't covid nobody would have showed up to the courthouse either right. so the fact that one it got out two i'm making recap videos every night it was their worst nightmare so any anyways they ended up trying to get the stream shut down so we couldn't do the videos and then on top of that the lawyer the law t- the lawyers or whatever the whole team the legal team for either willie or uh martin i can't remember which one said that they watched the videos 
and they almost use me as like a third party like judge. So each video they would watch the videos and they said, and I have this in writing. I can prove you, I can prove Dude, you. Dude, where's the framed letter? Where is I, the I know. framed letter? I, I, I literally have wow. it. I have the email. I could show you. But they said I love um, it. they said that they use our videos to shape their strategy for the next day. That's so they said, incredible. So what a compliment. I, That's incredible. Whatever I watched and said, like, okay, these are like important to me, they said that's probably important to the judge or whoever. So they would wow. basically take my points and run with those points. Wow. That's incredible, Zach. Zach, that that to me is the largest compliment that that anyone could ever give you. You know, you could sit here and be like, oh, you were the fun under this, that, and the other. That to me is the big because that's changing. That change that's changing people's opinions. And you're not only changing people's opinions on the internet, you're changing the actual stakeholders within the trial. That, that, that is incredible. The internet's I a think great the, thing, man. The biggest benefit that, that we had was perspective at the time because, because no one knew who we were. I wasn't like I was friends with Willie. I hadn't even talked to Willie until like halfway through the trial. He called me one day and was like, just like talking or whatever, but. I hadn't talked to anybody. I didn't know Willie. He didn't know us. Even like when we did interviews, like, I don't know who these filmmates guys are, but we're, I'm going to interview with him first. Right. So I didn't know Martin. I didn't know Willie. I didn't know anybody over there rocking. I didn't know anybody at flow. So I was really like pretty neutral as terms of like, I didn't have an allegiance to either one. Like I could have easily made flow look like the good guys, or I could have easily made, you know, whoever make look like the good or bad guys. But I was just trying to call it what I thought, you know, happened. Wow. It ended up being right because that's kind of how the whole trial ended up going down. Yep, sure is. Whatever, uh, whatever opinion you presented ended up being how it went down because it just actually got, it actually just went to awarding of the, uh, I believe they awarded damages or whatever, or, or whatever they awarded. It just happened, didn't it? Yes and no. So people were saying like, oh, somebody needs to cover this or whatever. But I actually reached out and tried to figure it out. And there's, it's still kind of going on. <laughs> But, but it's it's like now it's kind of up to like if they want to if flow wants to appeal it my guess is that they won't because they've already spent was it 1.2 million dollars going through this uh, and what the more judge, than that more than that what the judge ended up saying was like basically flow was trying to get damages and that was the only thing that they hadn't settled yet and i think i believe the judge said like all right you, you're not getting damages so willie's basically off the hook and now i think they're battling I think I could get this wrong, so don't quote me. I think they're battling like who's going to pay lawyer fees or if they're just going to pay their own, and then they're going to go through like the appeal process if they decide to do that. Um, so it's not quite over. It's crazy. It's still going on. Wow. So enough about that. Unless you guys want to talk more, but let's talk uh, Street League Two. Yeah, right. yeah, it's fun. It's a fun so, event. We got a lot of Ohio on the card. We have. So, uh, so you talked. Yeah, go ahead. Go with it. No, you go. You go ahead. You talked to that Willie trials was the st most stressful week of your life. How how was leading up to uh, Street League One? It was a. Uh, it was also stressful. Throwing an event was a lot harder than I thought it would be for sure. Like you put on big tournaments and stuff, right? Right. That's what we're, we're trying to get you to come to Ohio, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I can't imagine setting up. How many mats do you guys have? Like, what's your biggest uh, we do, tournament? We do twelve in a in an arena. 12 match. Cra crazy. So then you have, yeah. that's, you know, what, 24 officials or 12 officials? Oh, no. Like, try like close to 50 with 50 breaks. Officials. and Oh, actually, more than that because we have officials on the tables. Like, so it's like at two days, 1,200 kids. You yeah. Know. So a dual meet is probably a walk in the, like, ours isn't really a dual meet, but it's kind of ran like one. So, I mean, one mat, two officials, one head table, like, that's a walk in the park compared to what you're doing. So eh, the but. thing, the thing with you doing had a lot, second, it was your first one though you had to do it right you know what i mean right the first one is is was only tough because there's so much we didn't know so there's so many meetings that we had where it's like we had to have a meeting to figure out what we have to do and then we have to find the right people who can help us do that thing now it's like now we know what we we already know what we have to do so we can skip that meeting mm -hmm. now we just have to find you know who's available that day and like Luckily, like everybody's available. So for the most part, it's, it's, uh, this, this second one, I feel weird that I'm not as stressed out about it. That's good. That's good. But what, October 29th, what, what's the date? October 29th. Yep. In nice. Des Moines. The good thing is it's the same weekend as preseason nationals. And that's a big, 
big uh there's gonna be a ton of wrestling people in town so yeah it I'm could be pretty uh that. i'm usually out there that. if you if you're in town come out I'll, yeah uh, last yeah. year we missed it with everything going on but um i usually bring a handful of guys out so if you're in town let me know we'll yeah, yeah. so so zeb what uh what questions you got for the uh street league two i know uh is it in the same venue so you're gonna have the same venue everything no, we're going a little bit bigger. So uh, the Iowa State Fair is a really big deal here. So we're going to do it at the Iowa State Fair Fairgrounds. And um, the last venue we sold out, which is good, but it was only like, it was like a 500 cap. Well, it was like, we had like, uh, we could sell out at like 500 tickets. Right. Because um, the mat took up space and stuff. So we sold like around four or 500 tickets. So it wasn't that hard to sell out. This next one is a lot bigger. It probably won't sell out, but we want to like see how far we can really go because um last time we had to tell people no and i hate i hate telling people no so uh but this one will be definitely bigger um really trying to now that we can not stress so much about putting the thing on we want to focus on like better production i think the stream's gonna be better the the live in-person experience is gonna be better like bigger walkouts like we just had a meeting with the production crew and like they're super pumped about it so should be good i like when you look at doing it I mean, yeah, so you guys did an excellent job, obviously. When you look at uh, being able to sell out what you sold out between four and 500 tickets, right, that, that, that's got to give you a, it's a, it's a shot in the arm, man. That's got to be confidence for you. And then um, I guess the big thing for me is having your cousin on the card. Mikey, yeah. How yeah. awesome is that? You, okay, so wait, Jared, I got to straighten something out. I know what you're going to. I know. Zach is actually, Zach is actually from Iowa, okay? Yeah. Zach's mom and Mikey England's mom are sisters. Yep. Their, their maiden name is Castalia. Yep. The right. Castalias is, is yeah. where his family is actually from. Is Well, the Toledo area is where, they, where they're from, right? Like a stretch, right? A stretch or Genoa? Where, where both, Genoa. both, right? Yeah. Both, did they go to both? Uh, I don't know. They they call themselves just, rubber maids. Just John, just John went to stretch it for a little bit for a cup of tea at least. So okay. So long story short is his family. He has Northwest Ohio ties. East Toledo, Genoa area is the East Toledo ties. Oregon. Um, I think Ray, Ray still lives. Ray Castelli lives in um Oregon, Oregon Ohio. Yeah. yeah, Ray Castelli is a great guy, by the way. Yeah, Ray Castelli. They don't make them better than your uncle Ray. Right. Yeah. 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 These something really awesome guy he works for British Petroleum BP. Um, yep. Ray Castellia, they don't make a better than him. Awesome guy, highly intelligent guy, but yeah, he's, a, you know, he lives uh, in Oregon, Ohio, but love the family. Great family. Just lives in us uh, as a uh, raised cousin. Uh, Just John lives in Castellia. Just John Castellia. He actually lives in San Antonio. Great yep. people, big wrestling fans. I love them. It's an awesome family. We go back 40 years with those people. Awesome people. But so that, so, so Jared, that's actually the connection between uh, Mikey's mom. Who's the main Carter, right? Um, say it again. He's, he's Mikey the co-main. He's co-main the main, co-main. Oh, yeah. Co-main. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Main card. Yep. So he's, he's wrestling Gerald Harris. So he's a, he's a wild wow guy, right? Gerald a, Harris. Yep. Jared Harris is an Oklahoma guy who went to Cleveland state. Yes. Yeah, stand to yep. your guys' question. Yep. But, so okay. he was a all-time wins leader at Cleveland State, I believe. Um, yeah, he's somebody. One seventy-four. He, he wanted a he wanted on the first card, and it was kind of like a day late, dollar short type of thing. So um, I told him we get him on the next one. Mikey was on. We don't really. I hate calling it the main card and undercard. It was just like it. It was there's the main events and then the not main events. But he was Mikey was not a main event on the last one. But Mikey's match because of how many tickets he sold, how many tickets his opponent sold ended up being like pretty much the main event because the whole place was on their feet and it was nuts. Like the other dude was a big Grandview guy. So he had like the entire Grandview nation was there. Cause it's in Des Moines. And yeah. we were, as soon as we were done, everybody's coming up to me saying, dude, Mikey's walkout was awesome. Cause he walked out in a fireman's uh, like, he was fireman, awesome. So he walked out. Dude, it uniform. was awesome. It was one of the he greatest things there. I've ever seen. He took, he pretended like he was smoking a cigarette and he threw it on the ground and put it out with his <laughs> foot, pointed at the guy. Like it was, it was like legit what we wanted, what we were going for. And so I told Mikey, I was like, Hey, you want on the next one? He's like, Yeah, like wrestling's tough, you know, like, and I was like, Dude, I'll make you a main event. We'll pay you 
you know, pay you good money and stuff. And he's like, okay. And then uh, Gerald Harris, like similar weight. Gerald wants to wrestle barefoot. I'm like, I don't know if we can do that. I don't know. <laughs> well, he's been MMA for 20 years, basically. That's what he said. It's hard to like, I guess it's hard for him to get his it is. brain around it is. wearing shoes yeah. again. I don't know. Yeah, he's yeah. Age, yeah. He's our age. Yeah, he's our age. He's 40, 40 plus years old. He's got a bunch of kids. I think Jared's got a bunch, or Gerald has a bunch of kids. Really good yeah. guy, though. Stud for Cleveland State. And I'm super excited about that. Now, listen, who is, the, I've been watching the YouTube guy. The guy who lost his eye from retinoblastoma, he's from Iowa. Jarrett Stodd, yeah. So he was – he's a TikTok – I don't have TikTok, Seb. I know you probably think I'm a young kid, but I don't have TikTok. Actually, I do have TikTok now. I got TikTok like two days ago because of – How old are you? How old are you? 20, stop, stop. How old are you? I'm like a couple months for being 27. Dude, so, I'm old enough to be your dad. Stop it. I, Still, like it's there's there's levels to this youth stuff, and I'm I'm now <laughs> moving on to the next phase. But he's a TikTok guy. He's got seven and a half million followers. Listen, we're trying to do something different than what everybody else is doing. Last time when we had this card, everybody came up to me talking to me about you know the sit like the uh, again here with the undercard work. The the guys like Mikey, yeah. the guys who are willing to go out there and put on a show. We didn't get a ton of people coming up to me. The, uh, talking to me about the more competitive matches some of the matches that were really good matches people weren't coming up to me and saying you know anything about it so i'm like let's stick with these matches like i know you guys probably hate this guy even though he's a cleveland guy but jake paul right see what he's doing with the boxing community a lot of people probably hate that but guess what a lot of people are watching it now so in my opinion we're trying to get guys that are kind of outside of the wrestling world because i think that's going to help grow wrestling altogether if we can bring in you know people who uh, have a completely different audience than the same guys we see wrestling on the flow cards or the same guys we see on these rock fin cards or whatever we're trying to get in a completely different audience and we'll see if it works if it doesn't work we'll scrap it and we'll do something else logan paul was a division one state placer in ohio a phenomenal yeah. athlete and an all-state tailback for westlake jake, it's insane all, and people yeah, jake paul was to- yeah yeah, go ahead. He's go the ahead. real. You're He's, from Cleveland. So listen, I want to hear your. I want to hear your so, guys' perspective. So, so hold guys. on. So Jake Percival, I know you know who Jake Percival is. Jake Percival is a four-time All-American for the Ohio University Bobcats. He's the guy that dismantled Zadek, uh, Mike Zadek, the year. Yeah, no quarters. It was quarters. It was a quarter. Okay, you're right. He beat him eighteen to four. Beat Mike Zadek eighteen to four. Mike Zadek was up for the Hodge Trophy, undefeated, the number, number one, one seed, right? undefeated, number one seed. Jake first person will beat him eighteen to four in the quarterfinals of the 2000, two thousand two NCAs. I think, yeah, it was in Albany. So anyhow, um, Jake Percival was their coach. He coached both the Paul brothers. What's he hey, say about it? Hey, hey, Seiko was their youth coach. Guy, guy really? Seiko coached the Paul brothers at West Shore. So you got to understand, and I got trashed like eight, 10, 12 months ago. I was like, no, Logan Paul's a legitimate athlete. No, he's a bum. He's this, he's that. I'm like, no, no, this guy's an athlete. So we, um, in my classes, we, we've been talking about what a side hustle is. And the Pauls, they're, they exemplify as to what a side hustle is, right? But it became their main hustle because... I mean, they made 20, 30, $40 million on YouTube from doing goofy things. And their early stuff was in Athens and Westlake, Ohio. Their early yeah, stuff was Answer his question. Answer his question. Hey, Jared, <laughs> what was his question? What, what, what do you, are they wrestlers, right? Is that what you're asking? What do you get, what do you Logan, think? Logan Paul can absolutely come on one of your cards and wrestle. Yes, to answer your question. They're wrestlers, right? Any other person, they're wrestlers, wrestling would yes. claim them. Right. But that's a no. that's the thing is like we've claimed everybody that, who's right. ever even there's so many celebrities Abe, that wrestled Abe Lincoln, for, Abraham Lincoln. They, they wrestled for five <laughs> seconds. Abe Lincoln. Yeah. For, yeah. They wrestled yeah. for they wrestled their neighbor in their yard one time. We claimed the wrestlers. The Logan Logan Paul placed at state. Yeah. Right? He got right. Fit. He lost he lost in the district finals to Abinator. How yeah. about that? In 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 like I don't know. I don't. How's the class? Get, like, was he in a good class? Like, uh, as far as like, Abinator, and, and, Abinator won the weight. <laughs> he 
yes, well, I mean, there's a way. in Iowa, Division One, Division One, yes, yeah, 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 he was right? in the highest. Yes, he was in the big highest, school. most competitive division, the big school division. Yes, to answer your question. But you're right, Zach. And, you're right. The, and we're trying athletes. to act like. Yeah, but they are wrestlers, right? They they are. No, true, no, guy, guy yeah. coached them. Guy Seiko coached them at West Shore. Yes, they're wrestlers. And it, like you're saying, Zach, every other community, you know, wrestling. Ah, these guys are bums. They're this. They're that. And I'm like, no. Those guys, first off, they're really good athletes. Right. Second off, second off, Logan Paul is a legit dude who he could have been a D1 guy, a 500 D1 guy like myself, right? Like he easily could have done easily. Let's just, let's put that out there. Like, and no, no disrespect to the D1 wrestling community and all the rock eaters and gravel eaters, but like the guy's a legitimate athlete. And for us That's not to recognize thing too, that with this, Jarrett Stock kid who's coming on and like a lot of the hate that we got was like Facebook comments and stuff. And um, it was just like, Oh, look, these influencers are coming in here doing this, this and that. Jarrett Stott was a three time state qualifier in Iowa. Like what? So they're he, acting he, like this is a gimmick. And the guy was went out I know. and uh, wore like screech. Like he was screeching right. and saved by the bell or something. Come on. Right. Like he, he, act, he actually had more, he has more Zabby's accolades. He doesn't know what that is. He has oh, more sorry. accolades than some of the guys on our last card. So it just, I don't know. It kind of irks me when I see that stuff, but at the same time, I got to remember that that's why we had him on the card in the first place is to have some controversy. So. And it's working. You let internet stuff irk you. Depends on the comment. If it's something Listen, about stop it, stop yeah. it. Cause I got to tell you this right now, like Martin Floriani, I always be like, I remember until like 2008, 2009, they had bad, but you could comment and flow and regular people could upload their videos to flow wrestling. Martin Floriani would be like, that should inspire you. That should make yeah. you mad. Cause it's not, cause he's completely insane. But he'd be like, why, why would you care what some random person on the internet says? But you should be bolstered by that. And I was like, I like where this insane guy's head's at. And, yeah. and it really like, it changed it for me because I'm like, no, he's actually right. I think there's like, uh, cause the last Iron Man was the last event I did for him in 2019. And, uh, it was with the nomad. <laughs> Anyhow, we did the finals and, um, I think it was Bazakis versus Crookham and it'll periodically pop up on my Facebook timeline. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, I forgot I did that match because it seems like a lifetime ago because going on two years when I have, that was the last event I worked for those guys. And I was like, oh, man, I forgot I did this. But, man, you should go read the comments. They're awesome. I'm like, these two guys are bums. And the one guy does this thing Facebook and the other just... people's DMs. And it's a cesspool. Yeah. yeah. And, and I love it when they, they start talking about Nomad's DMs or something in one of them. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. I'll... Yeah. And it's all it's me, comedy, it's just, though. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm like, that's awesome to me, by the way. I love it. it. It depends on what the comment is. Like, there's obviously some stuff that bothers you more than others. But um, I, I like sometimes, honestly, YouTube comments will get stuff sometimes where I'm like, like somebody said that one of our videos was clickbait. And I'm like, that wasn't even clickbait. Like, it was, anyways, I don't know. It just but, depends on what it is. But wasn't that your idiots. inspiration behind the, the Street League? Kind of the Twitter beefs, kind of get to get people going and, you know, show up? Yeah, a little bit. It turned into that. It turned it turned into that. I mean, yes and no. I mean, uh, we've changed kind of what we thought Street League is f multiple times. But, um, yeah, I, I did like the Street Beef stuff on YouTube that, like, people go and just fight. Like, they would have a problem. They're like, all right, fine, just let's go fight in this Street Beast thing. Um, I never really thought it would be what it is now in terms of, like, you know, having division one guys wrestle and like, we're getting, we're getting guys that I've had to tell people like, Hey, we straight up, like, you're too good to wrestle on this thing. Like we can't have you <laughs> like, that's tough telling somebody like, Hey man, like you're way too, um, you're too well, you, big of a name. You yeah. Had we that can't problem do with Dardanes, right? You couldn't find him. Dardanes, right? Nobody wanted to wrestle Dardanes. And then Colton McChrystal. Would you want to wrestle Dardanes? No, that's the Mikey was like, well, yeah, that dude used to go and like, beat people up on the mat like as as legal as you could um but my crystal was like oh, yeah i'll do felony, it felony right Tim? felonies multiple felonies every match win lose or draw actually 
Yeah. So, so you said it's changed, right? Uh, street league has changed. Where do you see it headed? Like, it, do you want to keep growing it bigger? Do you want to keep it in a small venue? You know, what, what's the, what's I mean, the, the big, the, the bigger, the better for me. I'm just trying to figure out, I'm just trying to figure out what people like, you know, do they, do they want high level matches? Do they want the silly matches? Do they want TikTokers? Do they want firefighters? Like what do people want to see? whatever we get good feedback is what we'll do and we'll run with it. We've had, um, we've had talks with people about what we want to do and, and, you know, everybody wants to tell you what you should do, I guess, but right. <laughs> um, we're, we just kind of go with what, what people, we go with whatever people like, like it doesn't always matter what we want, you know? I mean, I want to see Ian Miller versus Derek St. John rematch of the 2014 Concy semifinals of the NSA tournament. I'd like to see that match. Both Ian assistant Miller, coaches, both in great shape. I want to see that match. How about that? Start Ian Miller about be, that. He would be a perfect street league. Like the way that he wrestled, he was so fireworks. Like we want guys like that. We don't want guys wrestling like super conservative and and um we want people to go out there with a game plan of like like Ian Miller put somebody on their back, it didn't matter who it was. He was so fun to watch. Yeah, okay, but you gotta understand Ian Miller's brain has grown as a coach, and now he figured out that you don't have to hit the flying bondinis, boot scoots, inside trips. You can just like snap people down and run around them or grab their leg and trip them down. So he like, he's like conservative now. So he's boring. Hey, so. you're, you're a Kent State guy. Who's the greatest, who's the greatest Mac wrestler of all time? Oh, uh, Casey Cunningham, uh, Dustin Kilgore. Uh, Jeez. Mm, Casey Cunningham beat Clint Muster in the NSA finals. Highly successful, but his coaching kind of has clouded my excellent vision of him because he's such a great coach too i mean we, so are, we count like, Miz, are we counting mizzou though too uh i'll go with greg wojciechowski Reg, greg wojciechowski he's my greatest mac wrestler of all time university of toledo whitmer high school i would go with greg he's a multiple time ncaa finals ncaa champion for the toledo rockets i believe he lost to chris taylor in the ncaa finals so i'll, I'll go out on the limb and i'll say greg wojciechowski from uh university of toledo i and maybe that's wrong on my part i'm okay with that i'll own that but um, yeah, big let me, uh, big Greg Greg Wojcikowski fan. Let me ask you guys a question. What's this? What's this Sam White like? We had Sam White on the last one, right? And he kind of ended up being like he kind of ended up being like the star of the show a little bit. Um, what's what? What was Sam Sam White's like legend back in the day? I mean, he beat the, a lot the of the Neon people, Tiger. Right? The Neon Tiger the neon from Tiger. Maslin, Perry. He's on the next uh, one too, by the way. Hey Jared, what was Sam White's OAC's finish? Did he lose to uh you Logan lost Steber to in the finals? I think Logan yeah, he lost to Logan third. Steber. Yeah. Then he was a multiple time champion, beat Jamie Clark in the NCA uh in the state finals. Uh oh, I don't know what's happening here. We lost Zach. Oh, uh, we still there? Okay. Yep. So he yeah, I mean he beat Jamie Clark in the state finals and they were training partners. Um right, he wrestled, won a couple of state- wrestled for uh rigs, right? Yeah, he went to Illinois. You went to what? Yeah, Russell for Dave Riggs. I mean, he was in that elite group. So if you look at Hunter Steber, Logan Steber, look at Cam Tassari. That was a, that was a heyday, at, right? Yeah, Jamie Clark. Obviously, Logan Steber was the catalyst for that group. Sam White was always right there. And then you had Ben Sargent. You had David Taylor. Sam White was right in that group. So it's like he he earned his his keep. And I think you've heard of most of those names I just said, right, Zach? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Um, no, not like being like- sarcastic. No, no, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another guy that we have on the card is an Ohio guy, Mike Widmer. He's actually, I think, the head coach at Genoa High School now. Uh, he's like no, an MMA no, Bob, guy. Bob Bergman. Bob Bergman's the head coach at uh, – Bob Bergman is the head coach at Genoa, yeah. I think he's some sort of coach at Genoa. Yeah, so um, Mike sorry. Widmer. Well, how did you get Mike Widmer? How do you get a guy like that? I don't even know. People reach out. That's the cool thing. It's like we've had a ton of people wanting to be on it. Um a lot of the guys that are doing it are MMA guys. He's an MMA, he's an MMA guy. I think because they stay in they stay in good shape, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he's he's like uh, he's I can't remember how old he is. I want to say he's like thirty one. So he's going to be coming out. Um, so this could be and then obviously uh, Gerald Harris being Cleveland State guy, you know. So we got three. I think off the top of my head, three Ohio guys on the card. Uh, our guy Drew Bloggs is going to come out cover it. So Ohio oh, will be, he's uh, coming. He's coming with Neon Tiger, right? Yeah, I'm gonna. I want them to to do a video of them coming out. It'd be great. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The whole thing. Here's the thing for Drew, or for for uh, Andrew Gasper, right? 
Andrew Gasper had retinoblastoma, just like Stott. You know that, right? Yep. Um, Gasper normally wears a prosthetic. Stott, in a lot of the videos, is not wearing a prosthetic. They both had that childhood retinoblastoma. Rare disease. Or rare yeah, cancer, rare right? disease. Yeah, rare cancer in your eye. And what they do a lot of the times, what they did to both of those guys is they remove their eye because it removes the cancer and they, they uh, continue to live. But that, to me, is the biggest connection. When you say that to me, I'm like, Gasper, man. First off, Gasper was a goer. Was Gasper, a Fargo, uh, what, right? Gasper State lost a cr- placer. He, he lost a crazy, well, it wasn't crazy. It was a super, con- uh, him and Salzer, him and Nick Salzer, three-time All-American at UVA, they were teammates at St. Edward together. I want to say Salzer was a runner-up. And they wrestled in the semifinals because Gasper went home to his home school in Madison where he lives now. And they wrestled in the semifinals and I videoed it. If I didn't video it, I watched it. And it was this real, like, uh, it was semis or quarters. It was like watching two brothers wrestle. Mm -hmm. And Gasper finally took a headlock attempt. And that was how Solzer scored on him. Because Gasper was super dangerous with the headlock. Hey, hey, ask Gasper to rip a headlock. Be like, hey, can you rip a headlock? Seriously, and video it. Dude, he's a killer with a headlock. I'm not kidding. It's like a lefty. It's a uh, it's from left field, right field, whatever. He he's hits a big both Greco. sides. He's a big Greco. I think Greco Fargo. Yeah, it's a two time two time Fargo All American, and Greco's got little, little stop signs. But Andrew Gasper, you know, and that guy's a, he's a, he's a cancer survivor, just like uh, Stodman. That that's really interesting to me, whether there's a connection or not. But like to hear Drew, I'm sorry, Casper or uh, Gasper, to hear him talk to that guy that that would be special to me. I guess what I'm saying. Yeah, we could probably uh, probably do that. He was super pumped about it, and like, I don't think he. A lot of people didn't know who Jarrett Stodd was. So um, once he found that out, what's crazy about them not wearing the eyes is they have like glass eyes. Those glass eyes are like ten thousand yeah. dollars. I wonder if it's more. I wonder if it's more comfortable not to wear yeah. it. Gasper said he said it's just not comfortable, and he he embraces it. You know, he said he wore it for a while. You know, just because felt like he had to wear it, but now he's comfortable. You know, he's like, this is who I am. It's not comfortable. Yeah. I'm not gonna wear it. You know, that's badass. It's a prosthetic, right, guys? It's a prosthetic that goes right. in your eye socket. Yep. It's basically a piece of glass, I think. No, yeah. Uh, some of it's like, it looks like it's almost like uh, not late, maybe latex if they're not allergic to that, but it's like a rubber type. Oh, uh, yeah. If you look at it, like, I, you know, some of them are mar. I mean, guys, I'm completely mm-hmm. ignorant on this, but yeah, those guys, too, I was, uh, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm not like sitting yeah. here being like, I know. But I think it looks like a lot of them are like latex almost. Yeah. I would think I think that's right. Some type of petroleum based product. And I'm like, holy smokes, this is crazy what these guys are doing. And to live through that, right? To live through that and to their productive guy. It's not like it affected them, you know, like Gasper was a I'm just thinking killer, wrestling, man. if you can only see like hat, like or any, you know, combat sport, like I, I just can't he, fathom like how well, you can it changes see. your depth perception. It everything. changes everything. Yeah. And he, I mean, he mentioned that's why he was a thrower, right? Because he'd have his hands on him. And so it's just wild. You know what I mean? He felt it, but he felt yeah. it though. And he had he had pretty good hips. So that's awesome though. Like I'm glad you're bringing him out. Yeah, absolutely. Great guy. Both both those guys are, you know, also high level wrestlers. So it's not like they went out there and were bad. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I I love that you're getting hate though. Because it's 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 indicative of the wrestling community. They just they don't like change. They don't like outside the box know, thinking. It's crazy. That's I what know, you are. Me, though. Part of me wants to like, you know, be mad. But I'm like same time I'm like, well, this community's been a long a long time before I ever was. So I, you know, it is what it is. You're like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, um, what do they say? You could you can um, walk on water, and a hater will say you can't swim. That's what they say. <laughs> Hey man, uh, some other stuff, some other content you've created. I not, not to just focus on, I like talking about Zach, Zach, the barber, right? First off, how can I get lined up by you? Is it even possible? Yeah, I'll hook you up. I mean, if you were, if I didn't like you, I would say book an appointment and, but our, <laughs> our, our appointment, our appointment books are pretty booked up. So you just shoot me a text. I, the wrestling community, I try to hook, hook people up. I've had some, some listeners of the show come in and I definitely, um, I enjoy having anybody that's a wrestling person in my chair. And I, I'll tell you what, being in Iowa, there was one day I counted. I'm like, okay, I was just looking at my clients. I'm like, okay, this guy's a wrestling fan. This guy's a wrestling coach. This guy was a state champion in high school. 
this guy wrestled at, I had like five clients in my chair that were like high level wrestling people. So it's awesome being out here. I love it. I love it. So, Hey, my biggest thing is all of us are wearing it right now. I had to strip the, uh, you know, the, the max effort jacket off and change it's into Deb, my barbarian are sweating, hour. Are you sweating, Deb? No, no, no. I got the, I got the air turned up. I'm in the hotel room, right? I'm at a, a, a conference right now, but, um, uh, we're all, we're all rocking the barbarian and, and you fully embrace the partnership with uh, barbarian apparel and Josh Sasby. What has Josh been like for you as a partner to deal with, to get behind or critique things that you're doing? What's it been like dealing with barbarian apparel, Zach? He, they're the worst. There's I, I'm <laughs> only with them because nobody else would deal with us. <laughs> no, he came out for the last one. And I tell you what, like, my parents got to meet him and like, they're like, man, like, thank God for, for barbarian. And I'm not just saying that like straight up the only deal with them, like they were going to come out and like, they were going to sell merch. And we just wanted like a presence there. And we wanted like our merch to be for sale. Josh literally brought like tablecloths that were branded stalemate street league, a backdrop, like all these flags, all this crap that I would have never thought of right and just made the event look super freaking pro and the good thing about working with josh is you guys have known him longer than than me he is not on me about like hey do this do that why'd you do this why'd you say that like he literally is just kind of like gives creatives like you guys and and us like a chance to freaking breathe and like he knows that if he's you know if he's like down breathing down your back like hey you're not you need to promote you need to do this like it's just not going to work and he at the end of the day i will work with people like him where they just kind of let you you know do your free you know do your own thing and and josh is so like so laid back and the guy who is so busy as he is he just i was texting him today he's like and i don't he's like, what yeah somewhere overseas like he's like he's like yeah I'm, you know i just i got another plane let me collect my brain real quick and then i'll get back to you but i'm like yeah, no worries. Like I'll get back to you at the end of the week. He's just super, like, there's not an easier company to work with. And it's, it's awesome. Like, I also love, I know it sounds cliche, but like all the merch that they have done for us has, has just been knocked out of the park. I'm not like a big, like design guy. So he'll send me designs. I'm like, yep, love it. Let's do that. And like, he knows what sells and he knows what doesn't sell. And, um, you know, I think so far merch has gone well and, um, I'm hoping to, you know, keep it going for however long we can keep it going. Right on, man. He, he's a, you, you nailed it, right? He, he delivers, you know, the, the, the design, the product, everything. What's your, uh, personal favorite? Is it, you know, hoodie, obviously you got the hoodie and hat on, but what do you got like a specific uh, product? That's your favorite. I mean, I'm a hack guy. Um, I would say anytime somebody sends us hoodies, it's like, dang these, these people like went all out you know like we get sent shirts all the time not so much anymore because i think people finally got the hint that like i pretty much only wear barbarian stuff on our show um so i don't get a lot of like other companies clothes anymore right. um but everybody sends t-shirts if somebody sends me a hoodie or crew neck i'll definitely like shout them out or like wear it you know on camera for them or something like that big hat guy too i love hats yeah, he, he does it, man. I, he, he he figures out here here's what I'm thinking, then he he goes with the design and the layout and everything. I actually um was on Facebook the other day and all of a sudden I got a uh I was scrolling, I saw like a, a barbarian ad. It was D'Angelo Hancock wearing a barbarian shirt. I'm like, dude, that's a sick shirt. And I went on the store and bought like two hundred dollars worth of stuff. And Josh texts me and he goes, Did you just buy merch? And I was like, Yeah, I did. He goes, Can you tell me next time so I can give you a code? You know, and I was like, no, I was like, I just wanted, like, I bought it because I wanted it. Like, I could have asked, I could have bothered him for it, but I was like, I would have asked you, Josh, if I wanted it, and I wanted to buy it. I wanted to, I wanted to freaking buy it because yes. it was, it was cool stuff. I was only mad because some of it was sold out. So I'm making it like, hey, like, next time you make those, like, let me know so I can buy it. So I don't know. Yeah. He just, they just, he just knows what he does. And obviously, I, I honestly like what he does with like, I feel like the Greco community kind of gets left out a lot and like, he's really nailed. Um, like he has, I think our best Greco guy is a barbarian. Like he has an Olympian. Josh has an Olympian. That's a, that's, you know, how many, how many, how many apparel companies can say that they have an Olympian? Yeah. That's, 
Good point. Good, great point. You, you, speaking of Josh, you got to make a trip though. It's uh, it's not ideal for uh, a street league, but his his uh, facility. I think we could do it there. I think if we did it, it'd be more maybe like a streaming streaming card or something, yeah. or like maybe very limited tickets. We wanted we want to keep doing it. Obviously, you know, with our Patreon, we got to keep giving people content. So I'm hoping that we can get out to Cincinnati and and do a card. I also want to go to uh, Bellarmine down there and in in Kentucky, yeah, not too far, and from there, uh, right? see Coach Ned Shuck. We were supposed to go out last year to uh, the um, the West Army. Point, yeah. But since he's gone now, I feel like I should go to Bellarmine and go check him out. Are you going back to Campbell, by the way? Because I think I'm going to have a coach sent us on here soon. Are you going back to Campbell? Are you going to do that thing again? They want us. They really want me to. They've asked me a few times now. And that's my anniversary, uh, the same day as my anniversary. It's Good luck no. with that one. It's brother. a no. It's a no. I tried to be like, hey, I want to take you to a super romantic place. I found a super romantic <laughs> Airbnb in Boys Creek, North Carolina. And, uh, it took her about 0.2 seconds to find out what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> you got caught, brother. You I told love me it. early on. You're like, yeah, yeah, Zach, it's great. You're doing all this. But, like, wait till you get married and have a family. Like, things will change. And I don't even have kids yet. But it's also, like, like now that I'm married and, and like, you really have to take time to do both your real world and then your other world. <laughs> your you know? wrestling world, right? Zach, yeah. how, uh, your wife's a teacher, right? Yes, she is. Does she teach elementary? Eighth grade. Ooh, middle school. I just got done teaching eighth grade. Now I'm teaching ninth grade. And uh, she's special. I like that. What is her, uh, what what area? Eighth grade history. She's got some wrestlers oh, in her class too. Yeah. I am too. Yeah. I, I taught eighth grade history for, and she, geez, uh, I, for a long time. She's uh, at Southeast Polk, which is like huge wrestling school here. So um, she's fully involved in the sport now. That's awesome, man. That's great that you got your wife involved in it. And I love how you support her, man. You're always like, <laughs> you integrate some of her things into uh, your content. And I like that, like support a teacher. You're always supporting your wife. I like that, man. That's good stuff. Yeah, she she helped out with uh, Street League. She was taking tickets. And then um, just like before I got on here, I was like, hey, you're you're the director of ticketing. So you better get your, you know, get all, because she gets all of her friends, you know, to help her take tickets. So I was like, you're the director of ticketing. So you better get it all figured out how we're going to do this next month. So she likes, she likes helping. Listen, I know we're doing this backwards, but yep. I don't know if a lot of people know your background in wrestling. And I get you just did like a thing where you critique your own match, but what is your, I know we did it backwards, uh, but what is your background in wrestling that makes you so passionate about it? Where are you from and why are you so into wrestling and so diehard about it? I started wrestling in second grade. I liked it. I was actually pretty good for a first year wrestler. Um, and then, like, we started going to every tournament, and I liked it, but it was all local. And then my parents started taking me to, like, bigger clubs, and I was like, maybe, maybe I don't like it because I felt like, you know, now I'm, I'm running into kids that are, like, better than me and, like, you know, it's a little tougher, and I was like, well, maybe I don't like it. So I always kind of – I always did wrestle, but I was never, like, elite by any means, by any stretch of imagination. Um you know, I, I, re I was always super small though. So we always had to find like these clubs that we could find kids that were my age and my weight. And so that was always a challenge. Then when I got to be like junior high, I was still way undersized. And then my freshman year, I weighed 89 pounds. So wow. I was like, I was on JV. I wasn't that good. If I would wrestle a kid that was 89 pounds, which happened, you know, once in a blue moon, I would win. And then, um, I took, I went, but it wasn't until like my junior year, I started like finally gaining weight. And then um, obviously varsity, but I was still small. Uh, then my senior year, I was like, I don't remember, like 30 and 15 or something. So I got better, but I was never good. I never, I always knew that I was never like, I always knew that I wasn't made from the same cloth as like my cousin, Mikey, you know, or like we had, I, I went to high school with like six different state champs, I think two different division one guys. Wow. Um, so I knew like, I knew what they were doing and I knew I wasn't signed up for that. Right. Um, but I started becoming a fan of the sport. Really, it wasn't till high school. I mean, flow and stuff was around, but it wasn't like it was. I remember the first dual meet I ever went to. I was actually super excited because flow was there. It was Iowa versus Iowa State. And our high school took us there because we had a tournament. And it was like after the tournament, we're all going to get on the bus and we're going to go to this dual meet and you guys are going to like it. And I remember to this day, 
it has I have never been to a more crowded duel at Hilton Coliseum and I, I'm an Iowa State fan we were so high up we were two rows from the top that's how packed it was because at the time it was uh I think it was Kevin ja- Kevin Jackson's like first or second year so he still had like the kale guys were still there like Varner and um um I'm trying to think of some of the other guys it's been so was long it, like was Sorensen, this when like, was this when um when Metcalf, Metcalf like held yes. Mueller's head down and then bulldozed him yes that was exactly jo- Joe Flo called it I remember wow. so that, that was the one it was it was packed and I remember thinking like this was freaking awesome and after that like I was I was like grew up with the era of like live blogging matches where it was like somebody was typing and you were just refreshing like it's basically live tweeting now but it would be like you know Ian Miller takedown two and then you know Ian Miller escape like you, you it was like that and then you would finally get the finals of like Midlands on Big Ten Network. And I just became obsessed with it. And I think like too, growing up in Iowa, there's so many division one athletes that come out of here in wrestling. So you'd be like, oh, that's Corey Clark. Like, you know, I know that kid or like, I, you know, I, or that's Jack Hathaway. Like all these kids that I like grew up around, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't wrestle with them, but we were at the same tournaments or like similar clubs and just being able to relate because you're, in it here you know what I mean like it, it was it was to me to me there's nothing better I don't know I just love it I love that you love it I love that you love it and I love that you took all the lessons of wrestling and you're now applying them to real life because so many people don't really get the actual end game of wrestling and it's like to create a good work ethic it's to create your reliance on teammates, whether it's an individual sport or not, it's to never give up. It's to do your best. It's always try, you know, finish, I think, be responsible, I think, cut weight, do your thing. Right. I think the big thing that with like, it's part of, it's like the greatest thing about wrestling is like, it's so like goal oriented, but the other part of that is like, you have so many wrestlers that make their whole identity, that goal. And like, once that goal is accomplished or once it's over, they don't really have anything else to like do with their life. Right. And I think you see guys like Kale do a good job of like, you hear him preaching about like, um, you can tell who the good coaches are when they talk about like, Hey, it's like, you know, at the end of the day, this is none of this really means anything. Like the lessons mean stuff, but like, as far as what you learn in the process of accomplishing that goal is that's where the, that's where the, uh, the honey is, you know, learn during the climb, you know, learn during the climb. There's being on the top of the mountain is a great thing, but nobody gets dropped on the top of the mountain, right? There's Everybody's got to climb really, it. There's a really good Bruce Lee movie scene that my wrestling coach one time showed us in, in practice. He literally brought in a DVD, portable DVD player, put like held it up and showed it, fast forwarded to the scene of Bruce Lee where he, he's like, he tells the kid to like point to the moon and he, and he points and the kid looks at the end of his finger and he's like, he slaps him. He's like, if you point to the moon or whatever, you're going to miss all this other, if you just so focused on this, you're going to miss all this other stuff around it. It's a great Bruce Lee quote. It's a great point. Actually, that's a great yeah. point. And, and, and like you're saying, you know, the great coaches, I remember coach Andresi like was like, these guys don't get it. Zeb. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He goes, they think that going to class is hard. They think cutting weights hard. They think wrestling's hard. And I'm like, well, it is. He goes, being a father's hard. Showing yeah. up to your job every day is hard. Yeah, Doing what do you think about that? Running this program's hard. Do you know? And he like he listed all these litany of things, and and Big Jim gets a bad rap, but like he went through this litany of things. He went through this whole list of things that are way harder as an adult than it is to like live your dream and wrestle in college and beat your best friends up every day and then live with them and then share all these valuable life forming experiences and these bonds that are still for me, you know, I mean, this is Jared and I were college right. teammates. Right. So it's like those, that's the real, the gravy of it is the thing you think that's so hard. The thing that's so hard is what's after it and, and becoming a man and it's you know, learning how to do your like, job. I would, if there's one thing I could go back and redo is like, I would love to go back and redo wrestling. Not because I think it would be um, not because I don't know. Like, I don't know if it would go better or not, but I, but at the end of the day, I'm like, I like, that's the one thing I miss of like high school was, was the process of getting better and the process of, you know, just the whole thing, you know, but you got the stars, you got the sky, you got them besides the moon, you got it all. 
and at least you're living like you did. Right. Um, I said to Jeff Varney the other day, Jeff Varney's my boy's youth coach. Shout out to uh, automatic garage door. Great guy. And I was like, you are what wrestling's about, Jeff. He never made the national tournament in the junior colleges and the D threes never made the state tournament. Who cares? Mm -hmm. The guy runs a successful business. He's making a meaningful impact in my kid's life. He's a great guy. He works his absolute. I mean, he works his, he works the guys. He works really hard. He's helping. He's got eight employees. The guy's awesome. That's what wrestling is about. Jared's dad's what's wrestling's about. Jared's brothers are what's wrestling about. Jared's what wrestling is about. That's to me, I think like you're saying the whole Bruce Lee right. pointing at the moon and missing everything out. There's so much to it, man. Zach, and people, what, about, what about Tyler? Like or your guy, Tyler, you even brought him up, right? He, he's probably what wrestling's about too, right? Zach, you there? We still got Zach. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about Zeb. I thought you said Zeb. No, Zach. no, Zach. I said Zach. Your your guy Tyler, right? He's kind of your right hand man. Like he's probably what wrestling's about, right? Yeah, Tyler. Um, he'll probably hate that I say this, but Tyler didn't start wrestling until he was a freshman. And Tyler was always like, he's one of those stories that's like, uh, what wrestling's about. He was um, never wrestled. He was always like a skinnier kid, like cross country kid. His family is like, they his dad was a baseball coach. His brother like played football. His brother ended up wrestling too. Um. But they were not a wrestling family from any stretch of imagination. They're literally like, he's my best friend. Him and his both of his brothers are like my best friends growing up. My, there our moms would have to sit together. My mom would have to like explain to Kim, his mom, like the rules, and mm -hmm. and also my aunt Kathy. Like they would explain like the rules, and like she'd be like, did he win or lose? Like you know, and Tyler, like from how he was his freshman year to his senior year, like he, he was JV most of the time. He was varsity towards the end there, but it was like. I love seeing kids like that. Like they showed up every freaking day and like watching him win, not just him. I'll, I'll take him out of this, but like watching kids like him win a match over a kid that they lost to. And like, just being like the, their faces and being like, so just pumped or like, or, or like a dual meet that doesn't mean anything in life. Like watching them win it for the team or like watching them get the fruits of their labor. Like to me is like, that was just as cool as seeing, you know, kids that i know win a state title and stuff like that like that that'll give you goosebumps any day of the week um and like yeah i mean i think everybody takes lessons away from wrestling i do hate that dan gable quote though about everything in life's easier after wrestling i think that's kind of bullshit but just i do you're like a state guy or what i mean he's a he was a psycho right but right, i don't know yeah. i just i just think like what what Zeb was saying earlier is like being a parent's hard, being right. you know, I mean, a, life a just gets harder, are, right? As you, as life you gets, get gets older. harder, but I wrestling definitely like, yeah, there, don't get me wrong, I shouldn't say it's total BS because there's times where I'm like, you know, if I'm doing something physical, I'm like, man, like I went through wrestling practice, I can do this, but um, I think it gives you confidence, but I don't know if it, I don't know if it means that life's easy after wrestling, you know. I, yeah, I agree, I agree that there's just, yeah, there's so much more to it then I understand what I get the essence of the quote and I get the spirit of it, but man, it is coach Anderson nailed it, man. These guys don't get how hard life is beyond college wrestling. And, and like you, like we've alluded to, and we've talked about, um, I think a lot of guys lose their way. They lose their way. You know? And we've seen that. And we could go through example after example of people who've lost their way, but I don't I think, really want I think to a lot pile of on people. No, I don't want to pile on people either, but I think a lot of it has to do with like, were, were your goals results based or were they not? If it's results based, well, if you, if you don't achieve that, you know what I mean? Like you, you you, people can go into, they can, you know, become alcoholics or they can become like just depressed or like they'll, cause, cause at the end of the day, like you run out of tries, right? Like if you, yeah, whether yeah. that's the end of high school or whether that's the end of college, like you run out of tries. So wrestling is not unlimited. You know what I mean? Um, so if you fail that, what's your whole life mean after that? But if you, if you don't look at it that way and you look at it as like, you know, progress and like, you know, did you accomplish your goals in terms of like, um, you know, your mental state and stuff like that, that's to me, to, that's the most important thing. You know, I think too many times in wrestling, we look at like, you know, state champion or bust, you know what I mean? Well, a lot of kids bust, a lot of kids that aren't state champions. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you know, does, what's that make you feel now? 
it could turn them into being like, you know what? I didn't accomplish being a state champion, but why don't I go, you know, be a successful teacher or businessman or whatever the heck it is. Um, so you see that too. But I think, I think the important thing is that really stressing like, you know, a sp- specific result, you know, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. In my opinion. The journey is the big thing I talked to Tervell about. I think the biggest thing he was like, you're saying, uh, you know, are you, are you defined by your results? Right. And, uh, what person have you become? That's, that's the, the, the general synopsis of what, you know, Tervell DeLagdev told me on, when he came on that barbarian hour was literally what you just said. Like, you can't let these results define you. And I think Johnny DeJulius, him and her, they were kind of reinforcing what one another said is, you know, are you going to let this result define you or, you know, are you results-based or are you process-based? Right. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, and I appreciate the, about that about those guys. And I'm glad that you bring that up. Jared, your brother, Troy and I, right. If it were came down to a result, um, I think him and I would be crawling into a hole in Sandusky and O'Carver, wouldn't we? Right. And you guys uh, have shown, you know, what, what, how you bounce not bounce back, you know. You guys have you know, made a name for yourself in the sport and out, out of the sport, and you're you're awesome people, right? I mean, share a same similar story, but it's uh, you know, you're both awesome people, right? Yeah. So Zach, the background there is Troy Opfer and myself. Uh, we are the youngest of both of us are the youngest of four boys. We're the first three boys. We're at least one time state champs, all of them, right? And then it got to us, the fourth boys, and we we didn't win state titles. Uh, Troy got beat in the state finals. He got uh, overtime pinned took, by uh, Ben Sargent. Third, second, second, second. Yeah, and the guy who beat him in the finals is an NCAA champ, Ben Sargent. Ben Sargent is Sargent or Jamie Clark. David Taylor has only lost. It's one of those two. I'm pretty sure it was Sargent, right? I think it's Sargent. Yeah, I think that Sargent's David Taylor's only high school loss. Wow. So Ben Ben Sargent is pretty good, but I think your brother was like. Six and two against Sergeant Jared. Right, six and two. And your brother was six and two against Ben Sargent, and his only two losses to Sergeant, he he avenged both of them. Later, later. One yeah. one was at the state tournament. No, and then both he came of them were state and, finals. Both yeah. of them were state finals. He yeah, beat him in college they, uh, too. Yeah, it's one, crazy. Of, one of the one of the guys on our cards has a win over Jaden Cox. What? Mikey England. Yep, and I believe it's his only loss. Somebody said it wasn't, but I think like in in like just the high school season, not like freestyle stuff. I think it was his only loss. So, how many more uh, matches do you need to announce? How, how many more are you gonna have? Well, 10? we have. How, how I think bounce? we have eight. We have eight confirmed now. I think we'd like to get somewhere around eleven. We had eleven last time, and. I was so stressed. I wanted it, the thing to get over. So I was like, man, we should just do 10 next time so I can, you know, make it go faster. But um, I don't know. The more matches you add, the more tickets you do. So I feel like, you know, we, we can't do can't do two less, but we also don't want to – we don't want to lose the attention. So I don't know. I think 10, 11 is kind of that sweet spot, don't you think? Yeah, I think shoot for 11, something happens, they drop out, then you have 10, right? The most annoying thing about putting this whole thing together is like, Hey man, put me on the card. And then you're like, okay, here's an opponent. And then they just, uh, I'm not that serious about it. I'm like, dude, then don't even bother me with the, with, with telling me that you're down to do this, you know? Yeah. That's, like going back that's and tough. forth and, and negotiating and, uh, going and like whether negotiating, it's like, how do you handle the wins? Is it like just same day? It's just so much cheaper to do everything same day. I know it's not as fun for the wrestlers, but we also don't want people cutting weight. So I tell people like, listen, don't cut weight for this thing. Like, if you are cutting weight, you're it's the same day weigh in, so be okay with that. If you do it two days, then you got it, then that's more you it's just so much more time and hassle, yeah, hassle. So nobody should be cutting weight for this thing. This is an Zach, exhibition match, Zach. Is there show money and win money in any of the matches? Um, so most of the that's the thing, it's like most of these. most of the matches are like voluntary, like guys like just yeah, want to yeah, go yeah. out there and, yeah. and whatever. Obviously, with the bigger ones, um, so like Kyvin and Pat, their contract was set up to show money, and then if they won, there was a bonus. So, uh, but not everybody's like that. Most of it's just show. I mean, here's the deal: it's an exhibition. So at the end of the day, like the win doesn't really mean anything. at Stalemate Street League. I like to think that they use the criteria for World Team Trials, and they said Stalemate Street League. You know, if you get a win at Stalemate Street League, you know that should mean something. But uh, 
No, I mean, it just depends. It depends on who it is. Like, we had somebody reach out. They wanted a crazy amount of money, and they had, like, 100 followers, and I barely – I didn't like, I didn't even know who they were. I'm like, no, come on. Let's, like, let's be real here. <laughs> so since you brought it up, and I don't – you know, um, I've taken a break here, and maybe I missed it, but you brought it up. Kyvan, um, Ky- Kyvan Gadsden, and, and Pat Downey. Can you? Yep. What details can you give us on as to what happened with Pat Downey no showing? Here's exactly what happened. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got it. No, I, I got no, it. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll I, tell I you. got it. Here's the deal. No, Here's what happened. Talk about it. It's fine. No, I'll talk about it. I don't care. I did a press conference. Sometimes too, I say stuff, and then somebody will come and tell me something. And uh, I'll be like, how did you know that? Like, well, you talked about it on the show. And I'm like, I got to stop doing that. You know what I mean? Like, I'll stop. Like, I did say that on camera. Um, Here's what happened. At the end of the day, P3 was supposed to be in town on Thursday. He flew to Baltimore to party for his birthday weekend. Totally understandable. So he flies to Baltimore. Um, And again, we're like. Pat's a peacock. You got to let him, you got to let him be Pat. We're not going to try to police him. Right. So Pat flies to Baltimore. He's supposed to party it up on Wednesday. He was supposed to fly from Baltimore to Florida. That, pl- that plane got deboarded. And I know that for a fact, he was not lying. So that was truthful. I know that because he posted an Instagram story and you literally hear the plane people, whatever they're called flight attendants saying like, you know, we're sorry, we have to deboard this plane, yada, yada, yada that happened so then i hit up pat i'm like okay well what's the plan here because you have a plane tomorrow out of florida tomorrow at 9 a.m out of florida and you're supposed to get to des moines we're supposed to do a press conference the day before so he goes yeah i'm not going to make that and that that was honestly that was not his fault so we called off the press conference that wasn't going to happen so he says tomorrow morning i'm going to wake up i'm going to fly from baltimore to florida Go home, get my stuff, get back on a plane and fly from Florida to Iowa because we had bought him a plane ticket out of Florida. So at this point, I said, well, Pat, I'll buy you another plane ticket. if You just fly straight from Baltimore to Des Moines, just skip Florida, because I know the more pit stops there are for Pat, the more chances are something bad's going to happen. So he (laughs) says, he says, no, I have a new sponsor. I have a new sponsor. I need to wear this new singlet that they have. That new singlet is in Florida. Okay, that's fine. I I I get I get it. Right. Yeah, Plus sure, he had sure. to get he had to get his he had a jujitsu thing that he was gonna do in Des Moines that have, same have weekend. So, have somebody overnight it, but okay, sure. Go ahead. He had a jujitsu thing that he was supposed to do the next day and everything. So there was belongings that he had to get in Florida. Okay, fine. So Pat said, Don't worry, I have a plane out of Baltimore at 6 a.m. I mean to get to Florida about 9 15. I rebooked the flight that you booked for me. Uh, to a different time i'll get to des moines about like 10 o'clock or midnight cool i wake up now it's the day before the event friday and it's the saturday event friday right? it's it no it's the day before now it's thursday so it's thursday, the day before sorry. it's, it's a friday event yeah i got it friday event so at the pause for a second two days before that i had posted on twitter i need somebody about 200 pounds to wrestle on a two days notice because somebody had gotten COVID and had to get pulled off the car. Willie Nicholas messaged me and he's like, is that for Pat? Because if Pat's not showing up, I'll wrestle Kyvin. And I was like, ah, nah, dude, come on. Pat's going to show up. Like, but I'll keep that in mind just in case. Ha ah. So keep that in mind. And Willie's like, okay, well, if Pat doesn't show up, let me know. Okay, cool. Anyways, Friday, the morning, of the, no, sorry, Thursday, the day before the event, I wake up. Hey, Pat, did you make it to Florida? Because remember, he's supposed to fly from Baltimore to Florida. He says, um, nothing. No response, right? Okay, whatever. But I also told Pat this. I said, hey, let's make it feel like you're not going to show up. That's going to help build this thing up a little bit. He says, oh, man, definitely. Like, definitely. And so I'm thinking, like, he's like, that'll help. Like, it's going to be hard for me to not respond to people, but we'll make this thing seem like I'm not showing up, right? So the day before I messaged him like, Hey, did you get, did you get on the plane from Baltimore and did you make it to Florida? No response. So I'm thinking, Pat, I'm in on the joke. You can let me know that you're not making it. Like I'm in on it. I helped create this. Right. Oh so he does. So he doesn't respond. And I'm uh, talking to, I'm talking to Sassy cause he was there and he, he knows Pat obviously. 
And so he's like, oh, well, Pat's the kind of guy to kind of like, kind of like, like I said, like try to hype it up a little bit. Like this will bring more attention. So he's maybe not wanting you to know too. So I'm thinking, okay, like you're right. So I'm like going on all day and still no response. I'm calling him, no response. I'm DMing him, no response. I have somebody reach out to him, like Snapchat him. And he responded to him. He's like, hey, I'm coming, big dog. This is noon the day before. Cool. So then that night, I see he posts on Instagram, like, when you're stuck in Baltimore, you drink whatever it was, some beer that is local to Baltimore. So I respond to him. I'm like, Pat, are you still in Baltimore? Like, you're supposed to be <laughs> in Florida, but you're also <laughs> supposed to be in Iowa. What's going on? You're still in Baltimore? That's the first stop. And then he does respond. He's like, I'm trying. He does send me a screenshot of, like, of his phone where he had, like, you could see, like, he had been on the phone for an hour and a half, you know, like when you talk to someone and you hang up and it says, like, the time. So he screenshotted that. And I don't doubt that that happened. I don't, I don't doubt that he at least put some sort of effort in. The thing where it's weird is, one, there's no communication till 8 o'clock at night, the night before the event. Literally, I have the timestamps. I have the receipts. So he's saying, like, I'm trying, and Spirit Airlines, everybody's on strike, da, 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 like, flights are getting canceled, da, da, da. I don't know if he knows this, but you can look up flights. Like, that's public knowledge. I can look yes. up, if you were to fly here tomorrow, I can You just go to Google, and you, you go to Google, and you actually literally type the air, airline and the number. It tells you when it's right. going to be, where it's at. It tells you all of it. Yeah, it's easy. Correct. So I didn't know that, but other people knew that. Other people looked it up. Whatever. So I'm like, okay, whatever. So at this point, it's eight o'clock the night before. So I tell him, I'm like, listen, I, I Googled flights from Baltimore to Des Moines. I just said, screw Florida. Like there's probably not this, that's not going to happen anymore. So I Googled flights from Baltimore to, to Iowa. Sorry. So from Baltimore to Des Moines, I don't know if you know this, but there is about three airports in that area in like an hour distance. So there's three different airports you could pick from. It's not like he's trying to fly into flight out of, Boise, Idaho, where there's one small airport and there's only so many flights. Right? He could have gone to DC Dulles. He could have gone to Baltimore. The, he could have, I found a I yeah. found a flight out of DC at 10 in the morning. This would have been granted, I just total transparency. This would have been the morning of the event. So I get it. You don't want to fly at the same day as your event, but at this point, we didn't have any options, right? So this was a flight out of DC to Des Moines, a two-hour nonstop at 10 in the morning. That's a perfect flight. How much did not that cost? Too, not too early. No, How no, much no. did that cost? 400, 400, 450 bucks. So hold on a second. Not too early, not too late. A two hour flight. You know what I'm saying? Nonstop. Would have got here at noon, would have wrestled at eight, would have got paid what he was going to get paid. Could have went to the jiu-jitsu thing the next day, yada, yada. So he responds. I was like, Pat, here's a flight. I was like, here's a flight right here. And he goes, oh, really? Where? As soon as he said that, I knew like, Ever. He ain't making it. No. He didn't look. At that point, I was like, he didn't look. That's like if you told your son or your daughter, hey, go vacuum that room. They say, oh, where's the vacuum? It's right next to you. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Like, you didn't even look yeah. for the vacuum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So at that vacuum point, I was like, is bad, I knew, bad advice. I'm vacuuming now, huh? I knew he wasn't <laughs> come at that point. And so I said, I, I told him this. This gets even sweeter. I said, if you buy that flight, if you get on that plane and when you land in Des Moines, I will pick you up. And when I pick you up, I will hand you 250 more dollars outside of the contract that we had already signed. Wow. Like just me being a good guy. Wow. But I knew he wasn't going to get on. And, and he, and there was just no response. Like to this day, to this day, we still have never gotten like a, a response back. Jeez. He stopped responding after I gave him that offer. And um, I wasn't really going to say anything. I was going to, I'd had to do like my biggest thing is like, I, you can't feel sorry for me because at the end of the day, the tickets were already sold out. Like the Patreon was already like good and stuff. So I felt bad for like the people who um, were expecting him to be there. And so like, I told him, I was like, listen, dude, like I just have to know if you don't want to, if you can't come, that's fine. Like I understand there's travel stuff, but at the end of the day, we have to make people be aware because it looks bad on us. Like we let people the wrong way. I was like, I have to get a replacement. I have to let someone know that, you're going to not be there and we have to have somebody else. And I have to let the fans know. And at the end of the day, we never got a response. So I told him, I ended up saying like, it was 10 o'clock at night that now it's 10 o'clock at night, the night before the event. I said, if you don't respond by 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, that means obviously you're not on the plane. That means obviously you're not making it. That means we have to get someone else. So that's why I said like, 
at 10 a.m. I'll do a press conference. We'll put somebody else on the card. Um, at the end of the day, though, I mean, it ended up getting a bunch of press because people wanted to know what happened. That's the first time I ever said it, too. So there you go. And you had, you know, Willie step or right step up. So it was like you're you're yeah. good, right? I mean, you do what you yeah. needed to do. You tried and you moved on. So yeah, I mean, it, it's it was like stressful, but at the end of the day, do not be like. I hope I'm not putting off, I hope that I'm not putting off the vibe of like, poor me, poor us. We got, no. cause we no, had people trying. reaching out. We you had try. people reaching out, like offering to give us money and like felt bad for us. I'm like, don't feel bad yeah. for me. We knew what we got into with Pat. Like right. we know if you play with fire, you could get burnt. We got burnt. We were willing to take the risk. Um, I don't have any sort of ill will towards Pat. I'm not, like in our contract, technically we could sue him and try to get money and for damages and stuff. But to me, it's like not worth it. Like, not worth it, I man. hope, I hope whatever's going on with, with him, like, I hope he gets it figured out. I know some people will probably hate that I say that, uh, but I don't know. It's, I don't know. I, at the end of the day, it's, it sucked, you know? That does suck, man. Uh, I'm guessing you won't be hiring again, him again, but how, how, what was the uh, turnaround for Willie Miklas who replaced him? I mean, I think he had a general sense that he was going to wrestle the night before around like, eight because i told him like at first i said nah we're not gonna need you pat's gonna show up and then i was like then about like eight o'clock that night i was like hey there's probably like a 40 percent chance you're gonna wrestle and then about 10 o'clock that night i'm like there's probably like a 90 percent chance you're gonna wrestle so let me know like your single size and your walkout song and then literally like when i did the press conference i finished the press conference i called him and i was like hey like there's i need you here so whatever time you want to be here he's like okay and you know what's crazy? He he's like already like he doesn't like when I say this stuff, but he literally was like he he was the easiest to work with. Like he wanted the money that if he won, he wanted it to go to um, Kaivin. Like he, as soon as he was done, he he literally hit me up like mad at me that I said that on air. But I don't care. I'll keep telling people. He like he said as soon as like he's like hey so we're on. I'm like yeah. And he goes okay. Well tell call Kaivin and tell him like he can eat because I don't care what he weighs. So like he is the most selfless individual in wrestling, in my opinion. Willie Miklas is what wrestling is. He is what your end goal of wrestling should be. Willie Miklas is what you, wrestling should be. He was not happy when I said that on our podcast that he wanted that, but I don't care. I like if he's going to be mad at me, he's going to be mad at me. People should know how good of a person is. And he was like, wrestling's not about that. It's about helping people. I'm like, dude, I know. Like, I think you people should also know how good of a person you are. So if that makes me a bad guy, so be it. <laughs> do they make him any better than Willie Miklas? I don't think they do. Do you know how good of a person he is? He transferred. Obviously, you know, his dad had the health stuff um, going on. That's a serious stuff. He's getting standing. O- he transferred. How many people, how many other guys have transferred and they get standing ovation from both crowds at NCAAs? You know what I mean? They just, like his they just don't make them better. They don't make them better than that guy, man. What he went through with his father and why he transferred back to Ames to be closer to home from Mizzou, where he was this outsider from Iowa. You know, he came in and beat the Hawkeyes that one year in, in the national duels at Carver Hawkeye, I believe. You know, I mean, what that guy did is just so incredible. You know, four-time All-American. They just don't make him better than that guy. And what he went through and what he epitomizes about the sport, I think that you know, we sit here and we focus on what, what Pat Downey didn't do. You need to focus on what Willie Nicholas did do. I think that's just my opinion. No, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. And, and Willie just, he just showed up and like, he didn't even ask for money. Like I ended up paying him what Pat was supposed to get. So he, he did make some good money. Cause um, Willie Nicholas is always just going to show up. Cause Willie Nicholas is always going to do what's right. Yep. And he was literally training with Kyvin, like, um, he was in town, like, I don't know, he's from, he's from here. So he was in town visiting family, but he was like, Hey, I'm going to train with Kyvin for a little bit. And like, he, and he, he didn't go out there and like, he went out there and scrapped too. He got to take down, like, you know, obviously he came off like a, what, 10 hour notice. So at the end of the day, like, man, like having just that whole, having him step up and do it to me, was like totally worth it, you know? Yeah. I, I yeah, I couldn't agree more on that. Once again, I'm not going to trash Pat Downey but I would like no. to focus on what, what Willie Nicholas did do rather than what Pat didn't do. Right. I mean, I think that's, I think that's the lesson. I think that's what wrestling is. Yeah. And I don't have any, I don't have any ill will towards him. The only reason why I was okay with saying like what happened there is because he put out those tweets saying like, you guys really think whatever. I was like, all right, 
you're not going to like make me look like the liar because I have, you know, I have a business to run here and I, and I, and I know like, I just said it straightforward. So. Yeah, man, I agree. I'm, I'm glad that you took the route you took and it's why you are what you are. And I, I appreciate that about you, Zach. I was actually hoping he was going to show up at world team trials. Cause I wanted to see what kind of shape he would have been in. Cause it was, it was, it wasn't really that, you know, it was only a couple of weeks after our event. So I was kind of curious right. to see, you know, if he was training and what that looked like. What's crazy to me though, I knew he wasn't going to show up to world team trials, not because of, um, you know, I thought Pat was going to no show, but I was like, as soon as he said he was going to, uh, you know, down to Jordan Burroughs weight, I'm like, dude, he was going to be up at 207. So his body, like, you can't do that. I don't think in that short amount of time. And so that's when I was like, I bet he's not going to show up because you can't put your body through that. Not, not in the right yes. way. I mean, who knows? The guy's a total anom- anomaly, right? He's just yeah. a total, I, he's an out, he's an outlier. He's, I mean, look what he did in college. Yeah. You guys, you guys that's realize what how many people. schools he went to? He, do you realize how many schools the guy went to? And he's still all American. At a weight he wasn't correctly at. <laughs> and I heard he wasn't even, I heard he was like at the casino more than he was in the, in the wrestling room. And like, he'll even tell you that we talked, we talked on our podcast about how, you know, he would just basically just show up and, and perform. And people were asking me like, you think he's training? I'm like, it doesn't matter if he's training. If there's one guy in wrestling who doesn't have to train and can just show up in his, in his singlet and wrestle, like it's probably him. Like some guys he's have to train He's a total freak. He's a total freak. He's an absolute you know? freak. You I think know. we attach well, that to too many people, but that guy's a real genuine mutant freak. Guys that can just show up and ah, you know, yeah. I, no training. It's, I mean, his genetics are incredible. He, like, look at his build. Yeah. Look at his build. Look at his abs. Look at his like, like obliques. And the dude's a total mutant. And he's an incredible talent. And I remember what he did to, I think it was Jared Hot at the NCAs in, in New York City in 2016. He like, Stepped across and hip tossed and pinned him, and, and I was Hot's like, "Oh my also god!" A freak. Yes, yes. I sat next Hot. to his dad at NCAA's one time, and like the same genetics, just like big individuals, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I, I think it was Hot. I want to say it was Hot and like the Conti, some Conti around. He just like stepped across and Hot, who was way bigger than him, he like double overhooked him and stepped across. Like that's not easy to do to Jared Hot. <laughs> no, I saw he posted that too the other day. No, I mean, I hope, I hope, I hope. Yeah, I hope he gets his life in order. Whatever he's, whatever he's doing, I hope he figures it out. Um, yeah. I, I really wish, I really wish it would happen because I, I truly think he would have blown the roof off of uh, Street League if he would have showed up. But yeah. Well, hey, let's focus on what Willie did. Willie showed up. Willie, Willie took a loss, but Willie battled. He did it on short notice, and he did what what we're supposed to do. And I think like that epitomizes what our what our community is about is what Willie Nicholas is about, right? Exactly. Jared, do you have anything else for our guests? Because we're going on the, right. we're going on the, the barbarian two hour. You're well over, over time. Is there anything uh, we missed to ask? Uh, uh, no, Zach I about? think we covered it all. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. If you guys ever have anything you want me to do, let me know. I'll be out there. Uh, I got to go to, I got to get to Cincinnati or I don't know where, where exactly you guys are. I know it's a big state out there, but we'll come out there and uh, I got family out there. So it's only right. Yeah, no. You get you, you the get trip. the Northwest Ohio. I'll make it. You get the Northwest Maybe. Ohio. I'm in. I'm Tony. I'm Tony close. Paco's on me. Huh? Tony okay. Paco's. Oof. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to a mud hands game, maybe. Only by yeah. for me. So. But, awesome. Right. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate it, man. Yep. Thank you. All right, Zach. Thank you for the time. Stick around for a little bit. Hello wrestlers and coaches, I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below and we can set up your first consultation today. 
I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice.